Well, good morning. It's so good to see you guys. I can't tell you what a joy it is to be back in Tyler. Marilyn says, do you want me to whistle? And if, if she whistled, believe me, you guys would hear it. Uh, she used to, to whistle to be across campus. And uh, yeah, wow, yeah, you can, you can hear that whistle. So anyway, thanks so much to, and let me make sure I get them all, Marion and Andy and Dave and Barry for uh, filling the pulpit while I was gone. Um, really do appreciate everybody's hard efforts there. Um, I know you guys were well fed uh, when I was in Kenya. Um, I was able to tune in, at least watch some of it after the fact, um, but I was able to tune in to pretty much every message. I don't guess we taped um, uh, the, the prayer service, but I understand the prayer service that Dave led was just fabulous as well. So praise uh, God for those things. This coming Wednesday, we're back in Second Chronicles. I gave a uh, report on the Kenya trip uh, this last Wednesday. Uh, hopefully you followed along online, and if not, then of course you can always... Uh, go to YouTube and, and catch, catch it there. We had a, a few pictures, but filled in what, what we did overseas in, in Kenya. And so it was a, a great, great time. Um, but there's nothing like being home. So uh, praise the Lord that we have the, the chance to be here today. Today we are getting back into the book of Titus. Uh, we've been out for uh, a couple of weeks, but we're back in the book of Titus today, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 today. So why don't you stand with me, open your Bibles. We'll read the word of God and pray. Titus 2, verse 1, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith and love and patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And let's pray. Our Father... We are grateful to be here. We're grateful to hear from your word. We do pray that we would feed on your word today, and that you would nourish our spirits oh, from that which is more valuable than bread. And in all of this, Lord, keep our eyes looking to Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before I get into the message, there were actually a couple things I meant to say during the announcements. Number one, uh, Dwayne Davis asked me to pass along his thanks to the congregation for praying as he went through chemotherapy. He was hoping to pass on his thanks today, but they had a water heater bust last night. So that, that's what that was going on. And also, one other thing, you saw that, that wood in the back? That's firewood. You're welcome to it. It's the last call for it, though, because if you don't take it, it's going to get dumped somewhere else. So there you go. All right, that out of the way. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Most of us get a bit nervous when it comes time for our annual checkups. I know I do sometimes. We, it's one thing to go to the doctor when we're sick. We don't necessarily like going to the doctor at all, but at least when you're sick, there's a specific issue that can be addressed, and you, then you just go on your way. But an annual physical exam, that's a little bit different, and most of us tend to put that off a bit because that's when our doctors take an overall look at our health, and they're looking for anything that might stand out as being problematic. Now, let me say, I am not a doctor, and I'm not trying to diagnose anyone today, and these are healthy, they should be done, they can save lives. But our problem with going is because, well, ignorance is bliss, at least that's what we think. As long as we don't know that we have a disease, that we don't need to worry about changing our lifestyles to take care of those things, right? So. As long as we don't know about it, well, we could keep eating the ice cream, right? We could keep drinking the sweet tea or whatever, and we're just none the worse off. But that's not true. We may not understand how unhealthy we are, but that doesn't change the fact that we might be unhealthy. And the only way that changes is if things are rightly diagnosed and we start doing the things that are good for us, that are healthy for us. 
when it comes to our spiritual well-being, it's just as equally possible for us to be healthy as it is to be sick. And unhealthy Christians abound. And we see it when people imbibe nothing but spiritual junk food, taking in only what feels good in the moment. And this is, you know, the times where people just look for always the promises of victory, always the promises of prosperity. They, they you know, look for the emotional hype that is more dependent on concert sound and lighting than it is on any real encounter with the living God. And those things just aren't good for us. Those things are sugary spiritual junk food. They're empty. What we need is something spiritually healthy, something spiritually nutritious. And where do we find it? We find it in the Word of God. Healthy Christians are part of healthy churches. They get a healthy dose of the Bible. And of course, that's exactly what Paul exhorted Titus to do. Now recall, Paul's writing to his friend Titus. His colleague is a son in the faith of Paul. He had left Titus, Paul did, on the island of Crete to continue the ministry which the two of them had recently begun. It seems that after Paul's initial stint in Roman prison, he had been released and he re-engaged missionary evangelism and church planning. And just like Paul often left Timothy as his apostolic ministry to help establish leadership in newly planted churches, so also did Paul do with Titus. Now in this case, Titus was on the beautiful island of Crete. It's the largest island off the coast of Greece, and basically it's halfway a midway point between modern-day Greece and modern-day Turkey. You got the Aegean on the north, you got the Mediterranean on the south. When exactly Paul visited the island, we don't know. We don't know exact reason why he went other than just being part of fulfilling the Great Commission. The Bible tells us that Paul earlier sailed past Crete on his way to Rome, and maybe he saw there a, a rich mission field. Whatever it was, he had the opportunity to return, so he did. The Cretan people seem to have been receptive to the gospel because what we find out from the book of Titus is that several local church congregations were planted. You recall that Titus's primary mission from Paul was to set in order certain things that were lacking, and along with that was to appoint elders in every city, per Paul's command in verse 5 of chapter 1, that there are multiple cities requiring elders meant that there were multiple church congregations that had been started. So each of them required solid doctrine. Each of them required qualified leaders. Well, what made somebody a potentially qualified leader, whether we're talking about a, an elder or an overseer? Well, unlike pastoral search teams today that often examine a, a man's ministry resume and his speaking charisma and his business acumen, Paul instructed Titus to look for men with spiritually mature character. The men were to be faithful at home, they were to be faithful in the personal life, they were to be faithful to the written word of God. And along, of course, with the spiritual calling of God upon the man's life, these were the characteristics that Titus was to search for in these potential church elders. He needed to search for these men because there would be other men who would present themselves and try to become teachers and leaders within the church. And they would be unqualified men. And their empty words and their wicked behavior would betray their lack of faith. And they would not care for the spiritual benefit of others. They just want personal benefit for themselves. And these people would claim to know God, all the while denying God by their works. So that ended what we, of course, recognize today as chapter 1. We've got the stern warning against these faithless men, these, these people who are potentially dangerous to the local church. So Paul gives some Kind of harsh words, but harshness was required because God's people are too valuable to entrust to unqualified leaders. Beloved, we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. By no means should we be led by those who do not know Christ or who do not value Christ's word. Titus was to be different from those false teachers. And this is what chapter 2 demonstrates. He and the men that he would appoint as overseers and elders, they were to faithfully teach God's word to God's people. And as they did, God's word would change lives. See, Titus wouldn't need to push and prod anyone to change and manipulate them to change. He could just point people to Jesus through the Bible, and then Jesus' word would do its work within them. Healthy doctrine leads to a healthy church. And for that, we need a healthy dose of the word of God. And so that's what we find, and we started off with his instruction to teach sound doctrine in verse 1, when he says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Paul begins with this strong contrast for Titus with all those false teachers discussed in chapter 1. Right? They were one thing, Titus was to be another. And we've seen Paul use the same kind of contrast and really the exact same language in his letters to Timothy. 
often also as a contrast to false teachers or, or, or contrast to those who would have abandoned Paul at some point in his ministry. So it's as if Paul is writing to Titus here, those terrible wannabe teachers, they're out there, Titus. You need to be aware of them, but you're not to be like them. As for you yourself, Titus, you're to be different. You're to do differently. Instead of Titus's speech being filled with selfishness and emptiness, instead of him showing himself disqualified from every good work, Titus was to show himself starkly different. His speech was to be godly. His speech was to be God-honoring. His speech, his teaching, was to be proper for sound doctrine. The words that came out of his mouth uh, would be the things that would, one, come from sound doctrine, being born of sound doctrine, and two, would abide by sound doctrine. So he's not going to be speaking out of both sides of his mouth, as it were, in hypocrisy. Rather, he would be led by, and he would teach that which was proper, that which was fitting, that which was suitable for sound doctrine. Of course, that begs the question, what kind of doctrine, what kind of teaching is sound doctrine? The word sound, which is used in verse 1, is used in verse 2, and you've got the same root word used in verse 8. Verse 8 <laughs> refers to that which is healthy, that which is well, that which brings a cure. And it could easily be said that sound doctrine is healthy doctrine. It is teaching that helps us grow into the people that God wants us to be. That kind of teaching is desperately needed by the church today. We long for that kind of teaching, even if we don't necessarily realize our own hunger and thirst for it. I, I've told the story often that I remember the very first time I went into Calvary Chapel, Dallas, Maryland, and I did. And we start getting teaching verse by verse through the Word of God. And as I recall, he was teaching through Ephesians. It might have been Ephesians at the time, but it was verse by verse teaching. And what struck me most about it is I felt like I was arriving at an oasis in the desert, not even realizing how thirsty I was at the time. And all of a sudden, you're just getting in the Word of God. Sadly, that kind of teaching is increasingly rare. Evangelical churches are filled with fluff sermons. They, they feel good and comfortable in the moment, but it, it has no substance. You know, you enjoy some fluff when you lay down your head on a, a down feather pillow at night, but you don't want your entire mattress filled with down feathers. You need something of substance for support. Otherwise, you're going to wake up in pain if you sleep at all. But this is what we so often find in evangelical Christianity, right? We, we find 10 ways to have a good day in your life. You have five steps of how to be a better father. You've got how to chase after and achieve your blessing right now. It's, it's fluff. It's empty. It's without substance. We need something sound. We need something with heft. We need something that's truly healthy for us. Where do we find it? We find it in the Word of God. And when the Word of God is taught to the people of God, then lives are changed. The good stuff of God's Word, the sound, healthy teaching contained in the Bible, changes our lives from the inside out. And how it changes us, that's what we're going to see in verses 2 through 10 in the rest of this text today. But before we get there, let me ask you if you long for this kind of teaching. We should, and understand that it doesn't just come from a few pastors out there. It comes straight from the pages of the Bible itself. Jesus understood the value of this kind of sound, healthy teaching. He even referred back to it when he responded to the devil in the wilderness. Do you remember? When he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4, he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. How healthy, how sound is the teaching of Scripture. It provides greater value to our souls than physical bread does to our bodies. But again, we lose sight of this, and we subsist on what is totally awful for us. I got a great picture of this when I was in Kenya here uh, last week, week before. We were going through this safari on the end day because our plane didn't leave until 1130 at night. And so we're just going on the safari outside of town. And we get to this one part in the park where we find these baboons. If you can fast forward, there you go. They're eating out of the trash can. Now it's cool, you can get up close. Now you don't want to get too close to a baboon. They're kind of mean, sort of critters. But they're eating out of the trash can. Now what's striking about this is just to the other side of this trash can is this, fast forward to the next one. I don't know why it's not working. This massive, awesome valley. And in this valley, you've got these beautiful trees. And actually, we could see down in one of these trees, and we saw some baboons creeping up and down the tree, enjoying life exactly how God created them to do. Now, you've got one set of baboons eating out of the trash can. 
You got the other set of baboons doing exactly what God created them to, to do, being fed the way God created them to be fed. If we only ate, if we only consume what God intended us to consume, how much better our lives would be. Too many Christians are eating out of the spiritual garbage can. How much healthier we would be spiritually, we'd be so much more prepared for whatever this life throws at us. Now, throughout the rest of verse 2 through verse 10, Paul's going to provide this list of spiritual characteristics that sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, produces in our lives. But before we get to the list, we're going to find that there's a little overlap between uh, the, the various demographics. You've got the older men, the, uh, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, and the slaves. But then you've got other items on the list that differ drastically from one another. And we might ask, well, does that mean each category is unique and, you know, uh, there's no application to these other things? For instance, you know, just because the older men are commanded to be patient but the younger men are not, does that mean that the younger men don't have to worry about that? You can just be as impatient as you wish until you get to be 50 years old. Well, of course not, right? Almost everything that Paul commands of one group could easily be applied to the other. There are obvious exceptions, of course. You know, older husbands are not to love their husbands because Christian men are not supposed to have husbands, which needs to be said again in this culture. But there is overlap here. But with all that in mind, much of what's described in these lists are qualities of Christian maturity. All Christians are to strive to walk in spiritual maturity and biblical faithfulness, and that's not limited to just one demographic or another. By the way, it's not even limited to church leadership. You know, if all we had of Titus was chapter 1, it might be easy to assume that church elders have the expectations of spiritual maturity, but the rest of the congregation does not. Obviously, that's not the case. We're given chapter 2 in addition to chapter 1, showing that spiritual maturity is not just an expectation for leadership, it's an expectation for every person within the church congregation. But again, this is the need for Titus to speak and teach sound doctrine, the things proper for sound doctrine. And the more he teaches these things, the more God's going to use the Scripture in our lives to bring us to spiritual maturity. And so we see these results first, starting with the older men, verse 2, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in faith, in faith, in love, and patience. Okay, first question, how old is old? I qualify these days. Old in this context is 50 plus. How young is young? Most scholars believe young uh, refer to anywhere between 20 and 30. So that means if you're in your 40s, you get to skate. <laughs> no, not at all. Doesn't mean you get to skate. This applies to us too, right? But about these older men, is there a difference between them and elders? Because the, the Greek words are very, very similar between them. The word that's commonly translated elders is uh, presbyteros. You might hear the word presbyterian in there. That's where we get the word presbyterian, presbyteros. It is possible to translate that word as old or advanced in age, but in the New Testament, presbyteros is usually translated as elder, just occasionally as old man. In contrast, the word here in chapter 2, verse 2, is presbutes. It's used only three times in the New Testament, and it's always translated as old man. And ultimately, the context, of course, determines the translation, but we see the difference here. So we definitely see the office of elder addressed in chapter 1, but in chapter 2, he's writing of the general demographic within the church. But in any case, the expectation for both church elders and the older men in the church is, of course, spiritual maturity. Paul lists specifically uh, six characteristics, and maybe we could sum it all up as dignified godliness, but he talks of being sober. Now, this could be literal sobriety, abstinence from alcohol. Metaphorically, it could refer to the act of self-control, self-restraint. Got the idea of reverence. The idea here is being worthy of respect, being dignified, even being holy. Rights of temperance. Uh, literally, the word might be translated as wise thinking or sound mind, the definition being uh, that of prudence and thoughtfulness. And this is something that's going to come up in a, at least one other uh, time in the list in a different form, different translation. You've got sound in faith. And this might be translated healthy in faith. The word for sound is the same we saw in verse 1. Those who are older in Christ have time to grow up in faith, and it ought to be a goal to which we strive. Uh, the word sound applies to in faith and love and in patience. Of course, love here is agape, so we're to be healthy in love, healthy in selfless, sacrificial love. This is the same love perfectly exampled by Jesus. And a Christian who's not 
growing up in Christ and becoming more and more healthy in agape love. That's somebody who's living in immaturity and in sin, really. And then, of course, sound in patience. And here the idea of patience is bearing up in difficulty. It speaks of endurance, of steadfastness. So these older men, these mature Christians, are to be healthy and strong, to be able to bear up when the times demand it. We know life isn't always easy. Healthy Christians understand the need for patience. Now, if you look over that list, and just with this one list in verse 2 regarding the older men, there seems to be a lot of overlap in these terms. And it doesn't seem likely that Paul is trying to, you know, parse out the various nuances between the words. He's painting a general picture. How are the older men in the Cretan congregation supposed to act? They're to act as Christians, not as Cretans. Remember how Paul generalized the reputation of the Cretan men, and he was quoting the words of the Cretan philosophers. You can look back in your Bible, chapter 1, verse 12. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Overgeneralization, perhaps, but this came from their own people. The description given here by Paul of the spiritually mature men is the opposite of those things. Instead of looking and acting like their Cretan neighbors, they were to look and act like Jesus Christ. Isn't that the goal of discipleship? A disciple is to be like his or her master. And in our case, our master is the Lord Jesus. So our character ought to reflect his character. Now, does that happen overnight? I wish it did. Now, we're forgiven in an instant. We're reconciled with God the very moment that we trust Christ as Savior and Lord, something that's available to anyone at any time. But life transformation takes a lifetime. Now, some things might change immediately, other things don't. But eventually, things do change, or at least they should change. Our goal is to be more and more like Jesus every day. And, of course, it doesn't happen by our power. It happens by his spirit. So you've got the older men. You've got the older women. Verse 3 and first part of verse 4, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women. Now, of the older women in the congregation of Crete, they were to be just as spiritually mature as the older men. We might say here that they were to exercise godly restraint. First, it talks about being reverent in behavior. The word for reverent here is different than that what was used in verse 2. It's also different than that which is used in verse 7. Here, the word is related to the words for priest and sanctuary, temple. In the form that Paul uses here, and this, the only time this word is used in the New Testament, is a combination of being religiously holy and fitting. That's what this word is. So we might say that it's a behavior or demeanor that befits holiness. And put it another way, it's a walk that matches the talk. There's a lot in these verses that's going to warn against hypocrisy. That's a danger for any demographic. Old man, old lady. Please don't take that the wrong way. Young man, young lady. It's a danger for all of us. Have a walk that fits the talk. You're not to be slanderers, considering that the, the word for slander is diabolos. We can accurately say that slanderous gossip is devilish work. Spiritually mature Christian women and Christians in general ought to stay far away from that. If we have time to gossip, certainly we have time to spread the gospel. We should be more productive for the Lord in that way. He says they're not to be given to much wine. I think it's interesting that the word given might be better translated enslaved. Addiction is slavery by its nature. And it's possible, of course, to be addicted to alcohol, but it's possible to be addicted to near about anything else. Just because Paul specifically mentions wine doesn't mean that, you know, Christian women have freedom to be addicted to everything else out there. Freedom means you're not to be addicted at all. Our job is to, uh, of course, discover our temptations and beware of those things and stay away from those things. And in some cases, it might indeed be alcohol. But in other times, other cases, let's be honest, it might be screen time. We get addicted to our phones. It might be food. It might be adrenaline. Getting that rush every time. Anyone can be enslaved to just about anything. Spiritually mature Christians strive to live in freedom. If we want to be a slave to anything, it should only be toward Lord Jesus. But in addition to exercising godly restraint, the older women in the congregation are to adopt roles as godly teachers. Now, at this point, some people have an objection. Because they'll say, wait a minute, I just got done reading 2 Timothy. And what about Paul's admonition to Timothy that women were not permitted to teach? Is this a contradiction in the scripture? 
Well, not at all. What do we know from Scripture? Scripture is to be interpreted within its proper context, and Paul's command to Timothy has a very specific context. We read in chapter, I don't know why this isn't working, in chapter uh, 2, verses 11 and 12 of 2 Timothy, it says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And it seems like a harsh restriction, but notice the prohibition against teaching has a very specific limitation. It is not that women are never supposed to teach in a church. Not at all. Paul's command is that women should not teach men. Because of the order of God's creation, because of the order of the fall, it's not fitting that women should lead and teach men in the roles of pastor or elder. Now, uh, we don't have time to go into a thorough treatment of these, these verses, but note these two things at least. Number one, women are supposed to learn. They're invited to be among the rest of the congregation and hear from the Word of God. And secondly, women are not supposed to teach or have authority over men in the church, just like most men are not supposed to teach or have authority in the church, because the role of overseer or elder is not given to every man in the church. It's given to only the men that God calls and equips. Now, as to the point for Titus, Paul shows that godly older women do have a role and responsibility of teaching. They are to teach good things as they admonish the young women in the congregation. Now, this idea of being teachers of good things, that comes from a a single word in the Greek. It's the only time that it's used in the New Testament. In fact, it might have been coined by the Apostle Paul but it speaks to teaching that which is inherently, intrinsically good. To teach that which is beautiful, which is useful, which is excellent, which is morally good. The things upon which the Philippians were told to meditate. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, what is praiseworthy. Those things in Philippians 4.8, those were the things that the older Christian women were to teach. Uh, let's guess, where might those things be found? They're found in the Bible. So are older women to teach the Bible? Yes! In the right context, with the right people, spiritually mature women are most certainly to teach the Bible. That means that women need to learn how to teach the Bible correctly. Just as much as it would be irresponsible for men to randomly say whatever they want to say about the Scripture, practicing eisegesis with the text, just reading into it, whatever you want to read into it, so it would be irresponsible for women to do it. We need to make the effort to learn how to study the Bible rightly in order that you are equipped to engage in your God-given responsibility to teach it properly. Who are those older women to teach? Paul tells us in verse 4, they're to teach the young women. The proper teaching ministry of the older women in the church is to the younger women in the church. They are to admonish, to encourage, to advise, to instruct these younger women in life and godliness. Are those the only people? Not necessarily. The older women presumably would instruct the children in their respective families, maybe even teach other children in the church. But as to their specific responsibility in the scripture, they are commanded to teach the younger women in the fellowship. Consider what this might look like in a church body. Older women taking younger women under their wings, helping them know what it is to be a disciple of Jesus, what it is to be a wife, mother, mother. How much better it would be if younger women in the church would have instruction offered to them from godly older women in the church rather than from outside influences from the world. If godly women remain silent, thinking that my service to Jesus ended the moment my last child fled the nest, from whom will the younger women learn? All that's left is the world. Now, I don't want to insult the intelligence of the women here to list the potential influences offered by our culture, but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out which women in this world have the loudest voices online and elsewhere. If we don't want our younger generation to walk in those footsteps, we need to give them different examples, and those best poised to do it are the godly older women who have gone before them. Now, what might this look like practically? Well, if you see a young mom who's obviously overwhelmed, come alongside and offer her help, and not just advice, but actually give her a helping hand. Or or take a young lady under your wing, invite her to, to coffee, start a Bible study together. But the key is for you to take the initiative. Don't wait for a young woman in the church to approach you. You approach her. Notice the command from Paul isn't for the young ladies to seek out older ladies for instruction, but for the older ladies to teach and admonish the young ladies. So that falls squarely on your shoulders. 
Take care to follow through. So you've got the older men, you've got the older ladies, you've got the young women, again, in, in verse 4, talking about the young women, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So young women are to be loving and dedicated. And verse 4 starts with two compound words, each the only time they're used in the New Testaments. And I'll, I'll give them to you. Phil Andros and Philo Technos. They combine the word for philos, love, philos, with the words for husband and the word for children. So love your husband, that's one word. Love your children, that's one word. Now, we typically think of philos or phileo as a friendship kind of love, but the word really has a broader meaning than that. We tend to simplify it down too much. It can just refer to being loving, being devoted. And Christian wives are to be devoted to their husbands, be devoted to their children. That's, that's part of just godly marriage. The, the characteristics for the young women continues in, in verse 5. They're to be discreet. This is the same word, by the way, that was translated temperate in verse 2. So this speaks of prudence and thoughtfulness and self-control. Why uh, King James really is what translated it differently. I, I, I don't know why they chose a different translation, but it's the same word. Discreet is temperate. You've got chaste. If you're looking at other translations, it might render this as pure. And the root word is related to the word for holy. Young women are just as tempted to worldly expressions of the flesh as are young men. We need the grace and the power to, of God to overcome. We need to be chaste. We need to be pure. Then it talks about homemakers. Literally, the word is house workers. Now, that's a hot-button topic today. <laughs> Must every young wife stay home and be a homemaker? It would be perhaps easy to argue that from this verse, implying that no Christian wife should ever seek any career or work outside the home. Now, let me suggest to you that that kind of interpretation is potentially, if I could speak potentially, anachronistic, meaning that it puts a modern definition upon this term that the original readers would not recognize. Now, in the cultures, household duties, of course, were the primary work realm of women, but it didn't mean that all they did all day long was cook and clean. You just need to read Proverbs 31 for an example. It describes a woman who's competent with negotiations of commodity purchases, of real estate, speaks of a hard worker, speaks of an artisan, speaks of a woman who's known for her wisdom. Certainly, this is not someone that is expected to remain silent. In the New Testament, we have the example of Lydia, who is a successful seller of purple dye. We also have the example of Priscilla, and she seems to be more influential in the, hus in the ministry than her husband Aquila. The Bible knows nothing of just a silent servant who just remains barefoot pregnant and in the kitchen, which is, you know, a stereotype that's often accused of uh, uh, Christianity as if Christianity is chauvinistic. And that's an extreme position, of course. A homemaker, if you stay home, need not fit that caricature at all. Untold numbers of Christian women give 100% of their time to caring for their families at home. Praise the Lord. They still show their acumen. They show their wisdom in all kinds of areas. So we need to be careful about putting our modern definitions back on these uh, New Testament terms. Sometimes it's not so cut and dry. The, the issue is how can a young woman best care for her family as she honors God? And it might differ in different circumstances. A single mother might have a very, very different answer of this than the wife of a doctor or a lawyer. But the main point is this. Godly wives and mothers dedicate themselves faithfully to caring for their families, whatever that looks like. So you got homemaker, you got good, of course, that's which is useful and beneficial, then it has obedient to their own husbands. And we don't have time to do a whole study that would take us back to Ephesians 5, but this is the same concept used back there, where it speaks of a willing submission of her wife to her husband. This is a young woman who willingly lays aside her own prerogatives as she follows the Lord regarding her husband. And you might notice her own husband, not everybody, other men out there, but she submits her own husband. Now, with these characteristics given, verse 5 does give us a purpose clause. Don't miss that. He says, that, purpose clause, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Might a wife's treatment of her husband impact her gospel witness? Yes. Might it impact the greater testimony of the gospel in general? Yes. By the way, it's not just young women or wives who might do this. Anyone who acts hypocritically towards the gospel that he or she claims undermines the claims of the gospel. Paul used the same language regarding bond servants who uh, might have been disobedient to their masters. They too might have caused the name of God and his doctrine to be blasphemed, 1 Timothy 6.1. So any one of us might do the same in our own hypocrisy and our own unruly disobedience. 
When we do not act as men and women who have been transformed by the living Lord Jesus, then the world around us assumes that Jesus did not transform us. And they think, well, perhaps he doesn't live to be able to transform us. As those who claim the name of Jesus, we are his witnesses. Now, we have the choice of being good witnesses or poor witnesses, but we are his witnesses nonetheless. What does your life testify about the Lord Jesus? And I'll confess, I feel my own testimony has been far too hypocritical too often. Now, thankfully, we've got the promise of forgiveness in Christ, but that's not a promise we want to abuse. We don't want to waste that testimony. Paul goes from talking about the young women to the young men in verses 6 through 8. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things showing yourself, speaking to Timothy, to be a pattern of, or speaking to Titus, to be a pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one having that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So as a younger man, Titus was to be an example to the other younger men. They're all supposed to be sober-minded, and this is the idea of temperate and prudent uh, back in verses 2 and verse 4. Titus especially so. He was to lead the way in this local church. Now, we're not told how old Titus was at the time of this writing. Presumably, he didn't yet fit the category of an older man, but that doesn't excuse him from seeking spiritual maturity. Paul knew Titus well. He knew of this young man's faithfulness, but that's not something for Titus to take for granted. And if Titus did not take care to himself to watch out for his own spiritual maturity, he might have easily become a pattern or a type of bad works rather than good works. It's a reminder to us that none of us can take our own spiritual maturity for granted. Just because you've done well to this point does not mean you cannot stumble. You could walk 99% across a tightrope or a balance beam and still fall off at the very, very end. It's not over till it's over. And it's a reminder that we are constantly dependent on Jesus' grace and the power of the Holy Spirit because we could do none of this on our own. Now, if Titus himself, he was to set the example in good works and in good doctrine, all that he did was to reflect the gospel, all that he taught was to be founded in the gospel. Again, this shows the importance of consistency, of having a walk that matches our talk. Doctrine without application, that's empty. Doctrine without application, that's hypocritical. So Timothy was to be wary of this hypocrisy. It would open him up to attacks and accusations. So what was his doctrine? What was the doctrine of all the young men in the church to include? It was to include integrity, soundness, and corruption. It was to include reverence. We've seen this word elsewhere, dignity, seriousness. It includes incorruptibility. Depending on your Bible version, it may or may not have this in there. The idea, though, does apply. The idea of incorruption is uh, related to the idea of immortality. And if this is original to the text, then Paul instructs Titus and the other young men to act as the regenerated believers that God has made them to be. They're not to act according to their old dead natures. They're to act according to their new living nature in Jesus Christ. And all of this would be demonstrated in their sound speech. Their healthy speech, their healthy words, their, the actions, the attitudes of these young men would be evident in their communication with others, and they would be seen as sincere rather than hypocritical. Do you get the idea Christians are to beware hypocrisy? Because it's all too common for us, and this world is all too happy to condemn us when we engage in it. Remember that the people out there in the world, they are looking for excuses why not to believe. They want to reject Jesus because they love their sin. By the way, just like we once did, we loved our sin. We loved the darkness and we hated the light, exactly as Jesus said in John 3, 19 and 20. When that world hears us saying one thing, yet they see us acting in opposition to that thing, and that's all they need for their self-justification to cast Jesus aside. Obviously, that's not going to excuse them before God. When they stand before the great white throne facing judgment, it doesn't matter who they blame. They're going to be held responsible for their own sin. But even so, we want to give them as few as opportunities for accusations as possible. The less hypocrisy in which we engage, then the less the world will be able to accuse us and to condemn us. The final category that Paul addresses here is slaves in verses 9 and 10. He says, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things not answering back, not pilfering, 
but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, I know the, the word is uncomfortable for us, but the idea of bondservant really is that of slaves. Some want to translate this as bondservants, and they, they see these men as, and, and women as being in willing subjection for various reasons, just having put themselves in this position. The actual Greek term makes no such distinction. The Greek term is doulos. That's just a slave. And that doesn't matter if you willingly sold yourself into slavery or if you were taken as captive. Once a person was a slave, it didn't matter how they became a slave. They were just now the, the legal property of the master, immoral as that may be. By the way, does the fact of the practice make it right? Does it make it biblically justified? No, we're going to talk about this when we get to Philemon in a few weeks. But it was a reality of the time, and, and Paul's not writing to you know a, a utopia of his own imagination. He's writing to real people in the real world. So there are slaves out there. He's going to write to those slaves. And as such, slaves were to be faithfully obedient to their own masters. Now that language should sound familiar, because with the exception of the term master, the wording is identical to the young women, the wives, who are to be obedient to their own husbands. Now this might sound strange, considering that the word obedience does speak of a willing obedience. And by definition, slaves are compelled to serve. So how does this apply to slaves? Well, simple. Though the slave is legally compelled to serve his or her master, according to his faith in Christ, her faith in Christ, he or she should willingly submit to the master. The Christian slave in the Roman Empire was not to drag his feet and be forced to submit through the whip or through punishment or other means. He is to willingly obey his master solely because of his submission to Christ. Let me suggest to you that would be a tremendous testimony for the gospel. Because no slave has any reason to obey the master apart from pain and consequences. But a slave who was a Christian, they could demonstrate an altogether Christian and different attitude. That slave could obey, not because the master deserved it, the master didn't, but because Jesus Christ made it possible. Can you imagine what kind of impact the church would have on our culture if we demonstrated that level of surrender to our Lord? where we were willing to give up everything just so we could testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I praise God we no longer have legalized slavery in this nation today, but each one of us can still demonstrate the same level of gospel transformation in our own contexts. But again, when people cannot see the work of Jesus in our lives, then they have got no reason to believe. So we need God's help to live out our faith visibly, being a testimony to his grace. Now, for the slave, what would this willing obedience include it includes doing that which is well pleasing that's which is acceptable to the master it, it excludes talking back in defiance it it excludes pilfering or embezzlement instead of the slave looking to see what he could get for himself he'd strive to be a good steward of his master's resources showing himself to be uh, all good fidelity or faithfulness and that faithfulness again demonstrates the gospel and the more they lived as men and women transformed by the grace and the power of jesus the the less excuses their masters would have to shut their eyes to jesus christ so you've got those five demographics in the church covers the whole spectrum of a local congregation depending on how you count you've got like 27 various characteristics commanded among them some that are specific to the the special groups others that are generalized to the entire list but in all that we've got this one overarching idea that of healthy spiritual maturity free from hypocrisy healthy spiritual maturity free from hypocrisy and how do we get there we get there through healthy biblical doctrine healthy doctrine leads to a healthy church Pastor Chuck Smith used to say of Calvary Chapel that he wanted the people of Calvary Chapel to be the best loved and the best fed sheep of anyone. Why is that? Well, because healthy sheep reproduce. No shepherd needs to prod rams and ewes to make new lambs. As long as the sheep are healthy, reproduction comes naturally. It's not any different with the church as the flock of God, Jesus, of course, being our good shepherd. He wants his sheep to be healthy. So he's given us the healthiest food imaginable in his word. And the more we take in, imbibe, nourish ourselves on his sound doctrine, the more our lives will be transformed by it. Do you remember what Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 12, verse 2? He says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is 
that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're only going to be transformed, changed from the inside out, metamorphed by the grace of God, of which we learn more and more through the word of God. So this is why Titus was to teach sound doctrine. This is why we were to abide in sound doctrine, not sugary junk food Christianity, not sermonettes that produce Christianettes. We're to not give ourselves over to emotionalism that rises and falls on concert production values and charismatic speakers. Guys, we need the Bible. This book is the primary way that God speaks to us as his people, confirming his word to us through his spirit, and his word changes us. God uses his word to transform us from the inside out, all as a testimony to his power and his grace. Amen. Now, it's so easy for us to get that backward. We think, well, I want my behaviors to change because I see myself in the mirror. I don't know what I need to change. So I'm going to want my behavior to change. So I'm just going to do what I need to do. I'm going to tighten my belt, going to pull up myself by my bootstraps, and I'm going to just strive by all my might to change. It doesn't work that way. That gets the cart before the horse. If we want to be spiritually healthy Christians, we need a spiritually healthy diet. We need God's word in our lives so we can live by God's power. So let me ask you, Christian, if you're living in powerlessness, just like a diet of junk food produces unhealthy bodies, it's no surprise when spiritual junk food produces unhealthy Christians. So start getting the good stuff in you. Feed on the word of God as your daily bread. Drink deep of the living water in Jesus Christ. Fill your breath, uh, your lungs with the breath of the spirit. And the more you take in of God, the more you take in of his word, the more you will see his effects in your life. And maybe you're here today, and I don't know everybody that's here today. Maybe this is all foreign to you. I'll be honest, when Paul is writing to Titus, you've got a Christian writing to a Christian about other Christians. Right? He's writing to things that pertain to men and women who are already forgiven by Jesus, who are already spiritually born unto eternal life, but maybe that doesn't yet describe you. You don't know what it is to demonstrate a life transformed by Jesus because you've never met Jesus to experience that transformation. Let me say as we bring things to a close that today that can change. You could be transformed from the inside out, be made a new creation today when you're forgiven in an instant by the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to him. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask to be made a new person. He'll make you that new person. All to his glory. You can do that as we pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. You sent Jesus for the entire world that all who would look to him and believe upon him would be saved. And maybe there's someone among us today that you're calling right now and in that heart and in that life they are convicted that they are they're estranged from you they don't know you they've got sin in the way but lord you offer to take care of that sin and you offer to forgive them you offer to make them your child so, Lord, help them surrender themselves to Jesus Christ right now. Seeing Jesus as he is, the Son of God who died for them at the cross, who rose to new life from the grave, proving that he is God. Help them see Jesus as the Lord, the risen Lord, then asking for Jesus' forgiveness today. Make them your son or daughter. Help them have faith in Christ. And for all of us, Lord, we ask for your help in being transformed by your word because, again, we can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can't do this on our own. We need your power in our lives, and you empower us through your spirit, working through your word. It all works together, so help us take in your good bread, Lord, that we would uh, be nourished by you. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.